everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and today's episodes are going to be a little bit different. Uh, we are picking up from a time right after Ignition Conference. Uh, Ken and some of the team came to my church at Franklin Vineyard uh, in Franklin, Tennessee, and we had a little bit of a Q&A on the history of healing and deliverance in the vineyard. Uh, this is sort of a part one of a part one and two because uh, we had two services and they were both different. And so we thought they were um, interesting enough to share with you all uh, on this podcast and on the video. So we hope you enjoy them. And uh, without further ado, here are Ken and I uh, discussing um, the importance of healing and deliverance uh, in the vineyard movement and also just abroad. Thanks. Hope you enjoy. Um, we have uh, Monday nights. We have our men and women's Bible studies that kicked off a couple weeks ago. Just want to invite you to that. We have small groups that are starting all over the city. Some have already started. We're starting new ones. We're starting small groups everywhere, um, which is wonderful. So find out more information online. We have a new welcome desk out there that you can find out more information on. Uh, next week, we have uh, baptisms. And so I don't know if you have that slide. Uh, we're doing baptisms on second service for next week, uh, and, uh, and we'll be getting, uh, getting more information out for that. So if you'd like to be baptized, uh, please let us know. You can send an email to info at franklinvineyard.com, and uh, we'll want to talk to you to make sure you know, that you're saved and stuff, and then we'll, we'll talk and we'll, we'll do it. You know? uh, but uh, that's happening next week, second service, and so we're going to do that second service. Uh, we have uh, some women's events coming up. We have the, uh, the women's conference that we uh, sold uh, tickets to. Those are still for sale. Bryony, are those still? Yes? All right, all right. So if you're interested in that, you can go uh, to the welcome desk and grab more of those as well. I think that'll be it for announcements uh, today. But there's, all of this is on the website um, as well. <sighs> okay. What a morning. Wasn't worship incredible? Man, so good. So good. Um, okay. I, I am going to have uh, my dear, dear friend, Ken, brother, uh, mentor, father, um, join me in just a moment. But to give some context to where we are and what we're doing, we're in the middle of a series uh, where we're going through um, vineyard values, uh, the, the things that, have, that make vineyard churches vineyard churches. Uh, the vineyard church... Uh, is more than just here. There are a few thousand of us around the globe. We've been in existence for uh, a little more than 50 years. And, uh, and the, the vineyard has been built upon a set of values that they hold dear to. We've broken them out into 10. And so we're making our way through. And these are from the mouth and, and the pen of John Wimber, who uh, began to the, this movement as we know it. And, and so we're, we're taking that from him. And if you're in any sort of corporate world, I realize 10 values are way too much. Uh, and so you'll notice that as we go through this, uh, we're, we're sort of parsing a few of the values out to spend our time on it. But as I was planning this series, I said um, one, of the, one of the values is uh, the vineyard value of, uh, of healing and deliverance of demons. And I thought, I know a guy who could help <laughs> us uh, talk on that. And so I structured the series a bit, knowing the conference was here. And, uh, and asked him to join us. And I don't know how you're doing. Uh, are, are you, I, I almost could, I woke up with drool this morning all over my face. Uh, I don't know how, you, if you're, do you know where you are? We're still in Tennessee. Yeah, uh, it's been a week. So um, if, if uh, I'm gonna have Ken come and, and I'm just gonna ask him some questions. So we do this little podcast and so it's gonna be like that. Can, can you welcome Ken Fish? I'll sit here. You'll sit there. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, fine. All right. What I wanted to do is just talk to Ken a little bit about uh, the history of our movement, about the history of um, of healing and deliverance. I think, you, yeah, just the red one. Let's see. That's what I pressed. When in doubt, say come out. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Come out. So... Ken, is, uh, Ken has been a friend for a long time, 
and has helped us and mentored our church in Nashville and has been gracious uh, with my relentless pursuit of him. And uh, Ken was, um, was with John Wimber uh, at the Anaheim Vineyard and his wife Beth as well. Um, these are Vineyard OGs. Uh, and, uh, and, and he was with John Wimber. And, uh, Do I get to carry the weapons if I'm going to be an OG? Absolutely. Um, and he helped, he helped ghostwrite his, his lectures and his sermons. And so uh, he, he really is truly a son of John Wimber and, um, and is one of the few left standing. And it really embodies uh, the values of our movement, honestly, just, just to a T. It's, it's incredible. And so, um, so we're really honored uh, to have you here, you and Beth, and to be a part of, uh, of everything. Beth, can you stand and just let everyone see you? This is Ken's wife, Beth. So, uh, Mama Fish is what she's been called recently. Uh, Her handle on social media is Mama Fishy. Oh, is that right? If you want, <laughs> okay. if you want, if you want all the uh, family goings on, a lot of whatever, pastors and preachers and whatnot, they post all their stuff. I don't really post very much at all. I don't have time for it. And some of it really annoys me, so it's just better for me not to be engaged. But if you want to keep up on the goings-on in the Fish family, not like official Orbis communications, follow Mama Fishy, because she puts up all kinds of stuff about our grandchildren and our daughters and, I don't know, whatever... All the of the latest, all of deal latest is food. At the shopping mall, yeah, yeah. whatever. The, a lot all of the food, food porn picks. that's up there yeah. too. Um, so, I, I said food. Picks. Took a moment for that one to yeah, sink I, in. I said food picks. <laughs> Ken said food porn. So there's the difference. Um, you know, I learned that term in Australia. There's literally when you're in Australia, like they don't sit down to eat without photographing their food, and then they post it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is food porn. <laughs> so it just kind of stuck with me and, and I, I don't know it may be slightly off color but it's funny so. <laughs> but we digress <laughs> oh we'll see if you have either of us back um, <laughs> so I just I wanted to, to just pick your brain for a minute and, and talk about this as a value I think for so many of us, we've talked about healing. We've talked about deliverance. Uh, we've done workshops here. Uh, if, you're, if you're not from here, you've done workshops just last night or whatever. Um, so I think, I, I was kind of thinking about it. I was thinking, okay, we, we cerebrally, I think we understand the biblical foundation of it, at least here in this room. But what I really wanted to explore is, um, why is this such an integral part um, at the heart of the vineyard in the original? What, what was going on in the vineyard that this became... Uh, something that was that, that John wrote. This is a value, and he and he actually wrote it as, uh, at least in some literature that I have, is uh, we value healing the sick and deliverance of demons. And so I just wanted to just ask you that question of, could you just give us a little bit of the history of that? Well, there's probably a couple of things that led to it. One was John's own explorations of the writings of uh, specifically George Eldon Ladd. Um, but also of Donald McGavran, who was a church growth expert. Um, McGavran, and John, just further context, John had ultimately, after his conversion, it wasn't immediate, but it, it took a bit, but he ultimately became the pastor of the largest Quaker church in the world. And it was the Yorba Belinda Friends Church. And um, this caught the eye of Peter Wagner, who was uh, teaching at Fuller Seminary. And Fuller was kind of a hotbed of the church growth movement in its day, which, by the way, is not even close to the same thing as the megachurch movement, just to be clear. Uh, but anyway, um, so this caught Pete Wagner's eye, and uh, Pete reached out to John and asked him to lead the Fuller Evangelistic Association, or the FEA, Foxtrot Echo Alpha. And so he went to work for Pete for about four years. And during that time, he became very influenced by Donald McGavran's thinking. And one of the things you'll note if you read McGavran's material, 
It's, it's interesting. He was all the rage 40 years ago or 50 years ago, and people don't even know who he is now. But he's worth reading still. And, you know, I would recommend maybe go on Amazon or go down to the local theological college and check out his books and read them. But anyway, one of the things McGavern noted was that people uh, were coming to faith in large numbers in what we used to call the third world because of healing and deliverance. And John thought, hmm, I wonder if that would work in the West as well, in what we then called the first world. And so um, that was vector one. Vector two was Fuller was also a hotbed of George Eldon Ladd's theology because he had been a professor of New Testament theology. He was a Craig Keener of his time. And he wrote about the kingdom of God. And no one had really explored the kingdom of God in a serious way. How does it ever work for you? Ever? Yeah. And really you heard an echo of this in Avner Bosky's teaching this, this week. Uh, because the church started to preach the church. And one of the, one of the key learnings that comes out of George Eldon Ladd's work is that the church is not the kingdom of God. The church is the agent of the kingdom of God, just as, an analogically, the U.S. Army is an agent of U.S. government policy when we choose to use that you know, blunt-edged tactic. I hear an amber alert going off. Um, <laughs> And so uh, George Eldon Ladd really clarified the difference between church and kingdom and drove home the importance of the kingdom of God. But when you start talking about the kingdom of God, you literally cannot do it without talking about healing and deliverance. And I've taught on this. I've you know, shown the roots of kingdom in the Old Testament. Many of you have heard those teachings here and there. I think we have them posted in the app. If, if you haven't, you can listen to him there but the net effect was that John was looking at what McGavern was saying about church growth movements and then he was looking at what George Eldon Ladd said about it theologically and he said I think this is a thing and so he started teaching on healing at what was then the vineyard Yorba Linda it went on to become the vineyard Anaheim which honestly is a difference without a meaning it's just where does the city line boundary fall and where could they find real estate but it became the vineyard Anaheim and these days everyone just usually re just refers to it as Anaheim um, but that's kind of the backstory on that so John started teaching on healing but it was a, it was a really about a year before anyone got healed and so the church was angry and people were leaving the church because, you know, you're teaching on healing. You shouldn't be doing this because a lot of them had followed him out of the Quaker church. And the Quaker church is pretty cessationist. They're not into these things of the spirit at all. And in that kind of 1960s into the 70s period, there's a lot of mainstream churches. I mean, forget prophecy and words of knowledge. Forget what we were doing this week. Uh, th this was not even on people's radar. What they were mainly thinking about was healing, and so the big controversy was, is there healing today, yes or no? And the answer pretty much crossed the board in American evangelicalism and British evangelicalism, or well, he's not British, he's Irish, but anyway, UK evangelicalism was, uh, is healing real? And for the most part, evangelicals said, no. In fact, hell no. And in fact, if you teach it, you're out. And so people had followed John out of the Quaker church, and they were okay with the newer worship style. But they weren't so sure about this healing thing. So people were leaving, and about a year in, someone got healed. And uh, it was a fairly dramatic story. It was a guy in the church who was, uh, he had uh, four kids, non-working wife. Well, she worked, but she didn't have a job. But well, that doesn't even do it right. <laughs> she didn't, she get, didn't paid. get a paid job. Right. Yeah. She didn't get a paycheck. But she was working hard. So anyway, he, he had to get up and go to work, and he was sick, and he couldn't go to work. And it was probably something basic like the flu, but whatever. He couldn't get out of bed and go. And he was like, if I don't, if I don't get healed, Pastor John, I'm going to get healed. And this was in the days when you could still call your pastor for a pastoral visit. I know. It was, it was in the last millennium. So John goes over, prays for him, and he gets healed and goes to work. Now, you can say, well, that's not a dramatic healing. It is when your job's on the line and you've got six mouths to feed if you count your own. And that became the breach in the dike that led to this flood tide of healing. And um, 
John would have never, ever said this, what I'm about to say, because he was a very self-effacing man. But um, there are many people who have written about the 20th century in American Christianity and also British slash UK Christianity. And notwithstanding many of the other names we throw around, I wouldn't say it's undisputed, but it is largely accepted that John Wimber had the most powerful healing ministry and the most widespread healing ministry of anybody in the 20th century. Hmm. Now, that's saying a lot. That's bigger than that's Oral Roberts. Yeah. That's bigger than, you know, whatever, William Branham or A.A. A. Allen or Jack Coe or any of those guys. Um, again, it's not indisputed or indisputable, but it is largely accepted as a true statement. But part of why it worked was because John also had this idea of everybody gets to play. And so he multiplied the ministry beyond what he himself could do. And, you know, whether it ought to be this way or not, he was the leader of this movement that became the Vineyard. And through it, because there were so many hands being laid on people all over the place, um, in the end, yeah, all that got credited to him, at least by the historians. Maybe Jesus will do it differently on Judgment Day. We'll see. Or maybe he won't. I don't know. But bottom line, that's how it works in the field of academia. So it all kind of rolls up under John Wimber. And even to this day, it's not really so true in the United States, but in the United Kingdom, most of the church is in free fall. I mean, it's literally collapsing to the point where I read a report from McCrindle, who's the equivalent of George Barna. Uh, what we, you know, here in the U.S. it's George Barna, but over there it's McCrindle. And he doesn't just cover the U.K., he also covers Australia. And McCrindle said uh, last year in one of his reports that by 2040, that's, 20, that's 15 years from now, well, it's not quite 2025, but it's close enough. By 2040, more than 80% of the churches in the United Kingdom will cease to exist Jeez. unless something happens and God pours out his spirit. And by, by 2060, more than 95% of them will no longer be in existence. Think about that. You are watching the literal collapse of Christianity in one of its most profound bastions for at least a millennium, at least a millennium. And it's all but gone. And yet, the few bright points of light on the UK landscape when it comes to the church are vineyard churches or churches that, as they now say in the UK, have been wimberized. <laughs> and for the most part, it comes down to healing, but not so much deliverance. Deliverance is more controversial. Yes. Yeah, which we can take that separately. But anyway, that's kind of an overview of how it got to where it is, and it's why we continue to fight and contend for healing, because... Everybody knows somebody who's sick. It could be yourself, but if it isn't yourself, it's somebody in your family or your friend. I mean, there, there's nobody who's more than one degree of freedom away from you or one degree of relationship away from you. There's nobody who has zero people in their world who need healing. And so this is one of the most accessible ways of demonstrating the reality of God's kingdom to people. Hmm. So in, in the... Um, thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, in, the, uh, in the context of, of the vineyard and, and certainly in the early days when you were there, um, was this something that would happen at all the services? Was this something that would happen all the time? Was it, I mean, was it a central point of, of what was going on in the church? Or was it something that would happen, you know, on a like, you know, Tuesday night, special service? No, it was pretty much all the time. Okay. Yeah, when I started going to the vineyard myself... John was preaching through Matthew, and he, he took more than a year to go through it, and he would just take these stories of healing and unpack them, and they'd say, all right, let's do it. And so sometimes it would be in the room right there. Okay, anybody who needs, I don't know, he'd usually get words of knowledge, so he, it would help that it was very focused on you know, what the Lord was doing in that moment. Everyone who has a sore neck, stand up, or anybody who's got a you know, bum knee, stand up. Uh, but other times, we had a, because we were meeting in a gymnasium adjacent to the basketball court, which was set up to be church, we're in a gymnasium, 
you know, you got the <laughs> you got the basketball hoops up there. You've got the bleachers that they can pull out. So we would pull out the bleachers. People would sit in the bleachers, say, well, that would be really painful. Remember that the average age in the church at that time was, well, John used to say under 25, but I, I've heard people say 19. So it was kind of a big youth group. And young adults are better with bleachers than, you know, 50-year-olds. So we'd do that, and then we'd set up chairs on the floor, and we'd hold church there. So sometimes we would do it right there in the service, but other times there'd be a room off to the side, and it was always there, of course. They didn't set it up and take it down. But that room next door, you could walk right through a set of doors there in the gymnasium, and we called this the back room, but what it really was was the wrestler's training room and where the people who did ballet with the high school team trained. So there were mirrors on the wall and bars where you, know, you could stretch your legs out and all that if you were a dancer or a, also a, what do you call it? Um, I wanna say acrobat, that's not the word. Uh, gymnast? Gymnast, thank you. And there were, there were mats, so instead of a hardwood floor, we'd roll out some mats in case people fell and then we'd pray there. And so sometimes John would just say, all right, if you have any condition at all, you know, just go through those doors in there. We'll have a team waiting for you, and we'll pray for you there. But, but that was pretty much the way it rolled in service. And then, you know, we'd have midweek Bible studies or whatever. And at, I mean, virtually every single meeting, there would be somebody who would get healed of something once the dam was breached. But in it, again, there was about a year where, you know, pray the heavens down, but nothing was happening until it was. Hmm. I, we have limited time, so I'm not going to explore that right now, but I would like to later. Do it at the 11 o'clock service. Yeah. We have limited time there, too, because I, <laughs> I have to take a nap. Um, I have to catch a plane. <laughs> uh, well, so let me ask you this. So that's healing. Yeah. Um, and so within this value, uh, it says uh, healing the sick and deliverance of demons. Uh, can you talk about that? Was that also taking place? Yes. So we started bumping into demons with regularity. And that was actually, it's not surprising if you understand the kingdom of God. And so demons began manifesting in you know, various settings. And initially, no one knew what to do with it because... Who knew how to cast out demons? It was like a lost art. Um, but it says Jesus healed the sick and cast out demons. And so because John, John was quite a biblicist, most people don't realize this. Um, I was talking with Craig Keener and with Derek Morphew. Derek knew John a little bit um, from those years. Uh, and Craig obviously did not know John. But anyway, I was talking with the two of them, and you know, you, you get into a conversation with those guys, they know their Bible backward and forward. Craig Keener can cite entire blocks of the Bible in the original Greek or Hebrew. He's really that good. It's like he's, and he doesn't seek to memorize it. He's just a scholar, and he's working with it so much, it's ingrained into him. And so you know, he can quote it in multiple English versions, and that's his normal reading but, but he's, he's just fine with Greek and Hebrew. So anyway, John didn't know Greek and Hebrew, but I'll tell you what, he knew the Bible cold. And most people don't realize that. So he got attacked for being unbiblical, and it was like, what a ridiculous thing to say. It's like when people say that about Bill Johnson. If you've ever seen Bill Johnson's Bible, it's like dog-eared, and it's got coffee stains on it, and the cover's all kind of you know back, and the whole thing, because Bill reads his Bible a lot. Bill doesn't have an advanced education. John didn't have an advanced education, but Bill reads the Bible. So when people say, well, you know, Bill's not biblical, John's not biblical, I'm like, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. Try to, try to play Bible roulette with these guys. Good luck. So um, John was a, was, an, was a radical biblicist, and he saw clearly that Jesus cast out demons. So he said, well, if we're going to heal the sick, I guess we also need to cast out demons. And they were manifesting, so we better figure out how to do this. And he used to tell the story of the first time he ever bumped into one. There was a girl who was, you know, young, young maybe upper teens, but, you know, young woman. And she was out on a date, and they'd parked the car. 
they hadn't parked, that's a different statement, but they had just parked the car and uh, this guy that she was out on this date with began manifesting. And so she called John Wimber, got out of the car and went to a payphone because we didn't have cell phones in those days. And so you, you can't text, you can't just you know, make the call, but she called Pastor John and he came out and he rocks up to the car, as they'd say in Australia, and this guy's full on in the car. It's like, wow, what a date. <laughs> and so they, they worked on that demon for a while, and John didn't really know his way around this either at that point, but they got there eventually. And, you know, the thing that was interesting was because John knew the Bible, at one point this demon said to him, and, and they'd been kind of tussling back and forth and getting nowhere for, I don't know, maybe about an hour. This demon said, you don't have any authority. And that was like the line in the sand. Because John said, yes, I do. Because the Bible says, <laughs> read the riot act to the demon about Christian authority. And you know everything's under the feet of Jesus. And I'm connected to the head. And so you're leaving. How dare you kind of thing. And you know, really that kind of indignation was a form of the gift of faith. And the demon left, and, uh, and that kind of launched us into the deliverance ministry. But it was, it was controversial from the get-go, because if, if evangelicals don't like healing, they hate deliverance. And it's rooted in evangelical theology, because the majority of evangelical theology, maybe not 100%, but maybe in the 90s, it says Christians can't have demons. And then John, John ultimately... Um, taught on spiritual warfare. Last night, someone walked up to me and had an old spiritual warfare manual from those years hmm. that he was carrying with him. And um, I remember working on that material with John, and he released that conference in 1986, and he did it in Anaheim, he did it up near Vancouver. It wasn't actually in Vancouver, but that region of Canada. And then he took it to the UK, and after that, um, the Vineyard USA board, the leaders of the Vineyard movement in the United States came to him and they said, John, you can't teach on this. He said, well, why not? It's in the Bible. And they said, because if you do, you will lose the evangelicals. And they're like your core constituency. You can't, they're, they're your target market if you use the language of marketing. You, you can't do this. You will literally destroy everything that you've been building. And so with that, he kind of I wouldn't say he stopped doing it, but he quit teaching on it. He muted out. And, um, and I think it is still a major stumbling block for many evangelical churches to this very day. And there are, there are major ministries uh, out there today that they, they will teach on healing, but they don't really teach on deliverance. And if they do, it's in a very packaged way. And... It's not only package, you, you know, you hear about things which, again, a lot of you have heard me teach on these topics, but quiet deliverance, no manifestations. It's like, well, doggone it, Jesus did not get that memo. Because the demons in, in his ministry were, you know, loud and proud when they came out. And so e even to this day, I mean, and, and we're talking about things that happened 45, 50 years ago. We haven't made that much progress. We've made a bit of it, but not that much. But anyway, John continued to minister in deliverance, but it was more quiet, kind of off the radar. And this was so much a thing that in 1993, he held a conference at the Vineyard Anaheim um, in, in, in what is today uh, the dwelling place. Because as most of you would know, the, that congregation under its new leadership broke away from the vineyard movement last year. So it was in that facility that is today the dwelling place. It's on La Palma Avenue. Um, I helped John with the uh, acquisition of that property and the reconfiguration, the internal construction work that needed to be done to make it suitable for a church. There's a whole story behind that building. But anyway, um, so in 1993, John held a conference and I actually don't remember what the title of that one was. I was working for him kind of as a, on the side at that point. It was about two years before Beth and I left. But anyway, he wanted to, he wanted to have a workshop on deliverance, but he didn't, he didn't do a main session on it. So we walked in to that, to that workshop, 
in one of the side buildings, and there were 2,000 people in the workshop on deliverance. So was there appetite for it? Yeah, people, people want to get free, and they want to know how to deal with this. But again, there's this overstructure in a lot of the evangelical churches, sometimes even Pentecostal churches, um, where they're like, no, that's not a thing, and you can't do that, and if you do, <laughs> hit the road. And, uh, man, the Lord blew that room completely out of the water. I remember there was a woman sitting on the front row. Uh, I won't give her first name, but she had been uh, present in Cambodia during the Cambodian genocide under Pol Pot. And her husband, um, he is kind of known in the right circles as the apostle of Cambodia. Of course, we're not supposed to use those terms in evangelical circles, so we, you, you wouldn't just casually call him the apostle of Cambodia, but he'd been involved in evangelizing people and he had narrowly escaped death multiple times under Pol Pot's regime. He and she met during those years and they got married. So anyway, she's, I, as I remember, it was on the front row, but it might've been the second row back, but she was very close to Beth and me and she went into this full demonic manifestation. No surprise, she'd been through the killing fields as they're known. And when she went into manifestation, more than one spirit of death was there. Her arms crossed, and she was Cambodian, so she has kind of a naturally very dark brown skin, and it went ghostly white, and her, her legs went together, and her toes went back like this, as though she were dead and laid in a coffin. And so <laughs> we drove these demons out, and it was in front of this whole crowd of you know a couple thousand people, and then like heaven opened and descended on the room and it was pandemonium but it was holy pandemonium mm. and uh you know in thanks for what happened to her she ended up giving beth a, a beautiful emerald and it was a big emerald in that part of the world there are emerald mines and i think that you know in the pole pot years that might have been how you carried your money around because it's very hideable and quite portable and so, yeah, she gave Beth this emerald to thank her. It wasn't a payoff. We didn't charge for doing ministry, but it was a, it was a gift of thanksgiving. That's awesome. Much to say uh, on all of this. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of teaching uh, available on the Orbis app for free. Uh, if you want to download that in your app store, um, there's the, the Orbis School of Ministry. Uh, you can find that out as well. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about it um, here and uh, in different teachings and series and all of that sort of stuff because, again, we're not going to go down this way because um, I want to make sure we have time to pray for a minute. But healing and deliverance are so intertwined, and, uh, and it's the reason it's in the same value. And, um, and, and most of the time that we see breakthrough and healing, uh, there's a deliverance component um, that, is, that is very necessary. And so these two things are very intertwined, and so we practice this quite a bit. Uh, Sarah, my calendar is full of, uh, of deliverance appointments, um, but we are now, we've started our, our prayer ministry uh, teams, and, uh, and so we now have 20 teams, 30, 30 folks signed up to pray, um, and uh, our own Bill McReynolds has been training and equipping and, and scheduling that. He was there with you all uh, at Vineyard. And, um, and so we, we do have those teams now uh, fairly equipped and ready to go. And we have appointments. We're taking them like doctor's appointments. And so um, we actually do it for four weeks in a row. And, um, and things will come out and things will get healed. And currently we have a 95% success rate. Isn't that awesome? Uh, Pete, Peter Wagner documented Bill's uh, ministry. And, um, and at the time they had an 80%. Uh, success rate uh, when Bill was doing this uh, at Vineyard uh, Anaheim. And um, he was telling me we've done some piloting programs, and um, he's like, we're up to 95. And so uh, I believe over the next years to come, we're going to get to 100. And, uh, and I believe that's what the Lord has. So if you do need that, you can, you can go to the website and sign up to that. We do have these cards over here that you can, uh, you can get, uh, that you can, you can scan those and sign up for appointments and all those sort of things. And if, if you do want to participate in this and you're around here, uh, we need all the help we can get. People are flying in uh, for this. And, um, you, I mean, how many times, you do way more than me, but I know that we, I joined you in New York recently for, like, a secret meeting 
of churches that were overrun with deliverance and, uh, and needed some help. And they, did, they met off-site uh, and because they were scared of people finding out that they did this. But it just was coming. Every, there's, uh, they're there. So anyway, more to say about that. And we'll, we'll be talking, I mean, much more we can say. And we will. Um, but I don't, I don't want us to, to live there today because we have 11 minutes. Um, and let me ask you, before we get into the prayer uh, time, here's what I really need. Uh, if you're here from out of town for the conference, I am so happy you're here. I need you to leave as soon as you can. <laughs> Hear my heart. I love you. I can't wait to see you. We'll do this again. But you notice our parking lot is very full, and we have a whole other group coming in. Could they put their car out on that frontage road that oh, leads please in? Please don't do that. Oh. Then I'll, I'll have a whole mess. With um, the police department. Yes. Okay. Um, but... Um, you know, uh, it, 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 we love you. We, we're so glad you're here. Um, you know, depending on how much you gave today, maybe you can stay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Let's talk. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, what is the value of two square feet of land in Williamson County, Tennessee? It's pretty high. Yeah, it okay. is pretty high. Um, <laughs> But uh, I just, I just, I really want to ask you guys, what's that? We have, yeah, we do have eight acres that go all the way to the road, and so if you're brave and you don't want to sue us if something happens to your car. Uh, or you get bit by a snake. Yeah, I don't think there's snakes. There might be ticks. Um, you can, you certainly can move all of those all the way down there. That would be great if you want to do that. Um, but I do need you to help me clear out the parking lot as fast as possible. Um, and uh, that would be awesome. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, Ken, if you wouldn't mind, is what, one of the things that I was longing for when I met Ken, um, I, I've actually grieved and mourned that I haven't, I was never able to meet John Wimber. Um, and uh, he changed my life uh, through YouTube. And so um, when I met Ken, and I realize the connection. I understand uh, how impartation works. I understand how spiritual sonship works, uh, spiritual family works. Through a whole series of events, I was in a room with Ken, and he said, I guess I'm doing a conference at your church. Again, it was all crazy events. He said, what do you want? And I said, I want impartation. I want what you have. And... Um, and it began to change the trajectory of my life, the life of, of the, the folks that, are, that were with us at the time. Some of, some of you are still here. Um, and we began to see, we were, we were having some healing. We'd seen cancer go. We'd seen all of that sort of stuff go at, at that point. And it was an exponential increase uh, in every dimension, in every direction. And as I pastor in Franklin, Franklin people need this theology of the kingdom. They need, not because we're so great at the Franklin Vineyard, they need the theology and the practice and the belief and the faith that we carry because most of my time is spent with people that don't go here yet and, uh, and, it's, and it's helping them and, and praying for them and, get, and it's bringing deliverance to them and they're extremely successful, extremely intelligent and they're smart enough to know there's a problem that they don't know how to solve. And I believe there's something so fundamental to what the vineyard carries uh, that the world needs uh, and we need here in Franklin. So, Ken, um, there's something prophetic on that. We'll ask Melissa when she gets here on this Amber Alert. Is there an Amber? Where's she at? Amber here? Anybody named Amber? Middle name Amber? Okay. Yeah, anyone's name Alert? <laughs> How about Al Ert? Yeah, Al Ert. Al Ert. <laughs> Party of three. Um, so, Ken, I've asked Ken if he could just pray an impartation prayer for us. Uh, this will not be your normal Ken Fish blowout service uh, because, again, I ask you to please hurry up and get out of here. Um, <laughs> And we're now down to six minutes. We're down to six minutes. But he will be back, I promise you. 
Um, and uh, we'll be doing a lot of things around here, and we're working on getting facilities that can hold uh, all of the things that we need to do. Um, so. You want to hear something cool? I'm going to, before we. Please. Just stay a moment. James, the pastor of Bethel World Outreach, where we were meeting, he actually offered us his church for tonight to hold a service because he, he knows where Grant meets, and he's like, you're gonna be, you don't have a big enough building for this, so do you want to use my church tonight? But we couldn't pull it together. We have various conflicts and whatnot, so we figured we'd save that card. But next year, we may well have a Sunday night service at the end of the event. So, you know, you, we will be communicating with you, but just think about this as you're planning your year. You might not want to fly out on Sunday midday. You might want to wait to go until Monday because we may actually hold a big healing service on, uh, on Sunday night. I'll take that as they like the idea. I think so. And uh, what are those dates? You have dates? to work more, Sarah. <laughs> What are those dates again? Uh, Wednesday, the 8th of October to Saturday, the 11th of October. That'll be the conference interval. And then if we hold the Sunday night service, it would be on Sunday night, the 12th of October. Awesome. Awesome. So here's how the impartation works. Uh, Ken will pray. Uh, we'll stand up. We'll receive. And sometimes when you're in an impartation scenario, you actually have to kind of claim and declare I receive that. And you have to say it out loud sometimes with your mouth, um, not just inside in your thoughts. And, uh, and so, any other tips? Well, Bill Johnson famously has said, if you follow him, I've talked with him about this. Um, he went to two John Wimber meetings when John was alive, obviously. And he was sitting in the crowd. He never met John Wimber. He just attended two of his meetings. And as John was teaching and whatnot, Bill said, Lord, I believe what this man teaches. In fact, I teach what this man teaches. He does it a little different because he has a heaven come to earth idea versus kingdom of God breaking in. And although it's a subtle difference, it's not, it's not identical. But Bill was very much in vain with all of this. And he said, so I teach this and I want what that man has. He never met John Wimber. He didn't have hands laid on him by John Wimber, but he got what John Wimber has. So Bill, John, Bill Johnson is known all over the world for you know, the healing ministry that he has. And uh, one time he flew to Jerusalem to pray for the mayor's wife, and then he flew home the same day. How about that? So that gives you some sense of, is this transferable? Yes, it's supposed to be transferable. And I think that's really the point here, and, and we've taught on this before, both Grant and I, but um, the kingdom is meant to be given away. Freely you have received, freely give. So even if you have blocks in your mind that are like, yeah, but, put the yeah, but to the side and just open up your heart, your mind, and say, I want this. I mean, I'm looking at Manny Kim right now. I don't know if it was maybe three years ago or four, or whatever, he started coming to meetings I, I lead in D.C. He lives in the D.C. area, but he's actually from Maryland, but we won't hold it against him. Um, and he, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't really doing anything with this. He was interested or he wouldn't have been coming, but he wasn't doing anything. And today he's one of our most powerful TAs. Um, he was a, my team leader on a very recent trip that we took. And I had him on the stage as MC on day two of this conference because, you know, I see the Lord's hand on him and I see how he's growing in all this. So this could be you. This could be your new reel. So stand up. Hold out your hands. Father, we used to speak of the blessing of the mother and the grace of the promises of people.
If you are interested in exploring courses with Ken through Orbis School of Ministry, click on the link in the description of this podcast or go to orbissm.com. You can also send any school-related inquiries to our registrar, Joe McKay, at jo at orbisministries.org. With more than 20 teaching assistants, Orbis School of Ministry has now trained over 100 skilled prayer ministers that provide more than 3,000 free prayer sessions through the Orbis Prayer Ministry Network each year. We would also love to help train and equip you to pray for others online or in your local area. Click on the link below in the description of this podcast and you can explore more.